but let's get to some really important things we want to talk about today. We're going to talk about lifestyle changes and dietary modifications that help with age-related macular degeneration. Now we're going to just say AMD for short. That's, I think, saves everyone a big mouthful of, uh, of big words there. So AMD, age-related macular degeneration. This is a little cartoon that Kim was able to forward to me. I'll just read it out for the people that can't read the screen there. But it says uh, the two gentlemen are at the diner and they say, they say that fish oils are good for eye health. Well, the other guy says, eh, I don't believe any of that. Finally, the guy says, besides, what about mackerel degeneration? <laughs> so thanks to Kim for that joke. That was a good one. Now, let's talk about AMD. We're going to go over a little bit of background before we start talking about vitamins and whatnot. And it's a major cause of vision loss over the age of 65. 2.2% over age of 65 are blind from AMD, and 17% at 60 years old have some form of it. So it's extremely common, especially in our country. 30% by 75 years old. So it's just a, something that almost will affect every single person in this country, either personally or by a relative or by a neighbor or friend. It's just that prevalent. Now, what causes AMD? Well, truthfully, it's not well understood. We don't exactly know. There's a lot of hypotheses out there, but nothing is proven. But in addition to age, which is the biggest one, that's why they put it in the whole title of the thing, age-related macular degeneration, there are risk factors, family history. I mean, these, this thing runs in families. There are genetics involved, hypertension, high blood pressure, cigarette smoking. Now, they say female gender. That's still debatable, but they do believe it's a little bit higher in females. Caucasian race, light colored skin, light colored eyes can definitely make you a little bit more at risk and a low intake of antioxidants could work against you. So let's talk about it, the two forms. Now everybody's heard dry, wet, dry, wet. Okay, well, let's talk about that. Let's find out exactly what all this is, right? The dry is more common, 90%. And when you hear drusen, those are little yellow spots that go underneath the retina. It's like little deposits under the retina. That's a pretty common sign of dry macular degeneration. RPE changes, that's just a fancy way to say when we look in the macula, we see little colored, dark colored dots in the pigment of the retina. So instead of being a normal color, it starts to look a little different than it should. Okay? Atrophy means it's wearing down. All atrophy means is things are thinning out, and that's the whole word, macular degeneration. Degeneration is that second word, and that implies that things are thinning out and wearing down. Like anything, if we use it enough, it starts to wear out. Right? So the wet type, 10% of the time is the wet type. That's the one that everyone thinks about and worries about because the vision can go down very quickly with the wet type. When we talk about exudate, hemorrhage, all these are words for bleeding, leaking, swelling. These are all wet words. So when we talk about the wet type, I tell my patients that means you have bleeding or swelling. Simple as that. There's a leaky blood vessel underneath the retina that's bleeding leaking or swelling and that's what's causing the problem with the vision. Unfortunately when there is bleeding or swelling it can lead to scarring and that can lead to even worse vision and we have ways to control the leaking like Dr. Singerman talked about but we don't have any way to remove the scarring at this point. If we could do that we'd have millions of happier people and people are working on these things just like he spoke about. What about, what about the risk factors? Well there's things we can't change. We can't change our age, we can't change our genetics, our gender, pigmentation, race, what color your iris. You can't change that stuff. But what can we change? Smoking, that's something that all of us can change. If anyone is smoking, you can stop or at least try to. Cardiovascular disease, your cholesterol, high blood pressure, that's all stuff that can be worked on with your primary care physician. Alcohol consumption, that can be worked on as well how much sun exposure you're getting directly, well, we can all wear sunglasses, and then nutrition, and that's going to be the focus today. Now, a really important thing is, how, how do we find out about macular degeneration in your eyes, or your friend's eyes, or your family's eyes? Well, you need a proper exam, and that's the thing. You know, in our group, we have nine retina specialists, and all of us are very, very well trained in macular degeneration, and that's important. That's what we do every day, day in, day out. When it comes to your exam, it's not just what you read on the chart. It's not just you know, dilating your pupils. There are other machines that we have in the office that measures the thickness of the retina. There's an angiogram where we put dye into the vein and take pictures of the retina to see if there's anything leaking, bleeding, or swelling. And these are very important tests to be done if someone has macular degeneration. 
And besides all of that, it's just very important to have a retina specialist look at the retina and see, is there anything going on there that we need to be suspicious of? And I'll tell you why. In regarding vision loss in AMD, the most common cause is the wet type, 90%. It happens rapidly, unfortunately, and that can make it very emotionally difficult. It's very difficult, it's stressful, it's frustrating. Many of you know from personal experience or from experience with friends and family that this can be devastating. The dry part, the dry is less common and it's really slow in onset. It's kind of a slow mover, but it does move. And all of you know, if you haven't been told already, that the dry type, even though we don't have a cure, it's still something we're very, very concerned about. In addition, you know, of course the wet, but the dry is still very concerning because it does move and get worse with time. So what are the risk factors? Well, we worry about people changing from dry to wet. I mean, dry is bad enough, but all of a sudden if it changes to wet and you start losing vision quickly, we really worry about that. So we look at people's eyes, and if you have these risk factors, big druse and a lot of druse and high blood pressure, a lot of thinning in the retina, these are all risk factors that if the retina specialist sees these things, if you have several of these risk factors, we're watching you more closely because we're really worried about you changing from dry to wet, and if you do change, we want to catch it right away so we can use the injection medicines to stop it in its tracks or at least try to. The worst thing is if it gets to go for months and months and months and months before we get to treat it, then we really worry that that scarring is going to form and we really want to prevent that. Now let's talk about the symptoms of macular degeneration. There's decreased vision up here in the upper left, blurring. The distortion, you can see that Amsler grid in the upper right there, how the, instead of the checkerboard being nice and straight, it's distorted. Sometimes you can get blank spots where you can't see someone's face or even not good contrast sensitivity. Here's the Amsler grid. I think most people have seen one of these. You look at the dot in the middle with your glasses on at a normal reading distance, and you want to see if all the lines are nice and straight. If things are wavy, then we start to worry that something's changing. You can see that change right there. Here it is without the change, and here it is with the change. If that all of a sudden happened, we want to hear from you, because that means something could be changing from dry to wet, and we need to check to make sure, hopefully, it's not doing that. This is something we call the filling in phenomenon. You can see everything's blurry except this guy's eye. So what happens is our minds try to make up for that. They see the clear eye, and the mind kind of fills in the rest. So the problem is a lot of people, if they have one good eye, one eye that's blurry, they don't really pick up on the blurry eye because your mind is filling in all the missing information. So that's what makes it really difficult unless you take one eye at a time carefully. So the goal we have is to prevent the change up from dry to wet, first of all. And one of the things for the dry, we want to prevent it from getting worse. And that's where we talk about the AREDs. And I'm going to talk about that in just a second here. Just like I said earlier, patients f fail to notice the problem with the macula because maybe the other eye is overcompensating or maybe their mind is just filling in the blanks and they're not realizing that some part of the vision is missing. So again, we want to prevent, we want to prevent the loss of vision from the wet type and if you have the wet type, we want to keep it in control. Here's a picture of a patient that I saw when I was in New York. This is the right eye and it has the dry type. You can see right in the middle here all these spots that we call the druse and these little yellow dots. So that was the right eye. And then unfortunately the left eye became wet and it bled all of a sudden. And you can see all that dark blood underneath the retina. And unfortunately this eye lost a lot of vision. But there was nothing he did or didn't do right or wrong, it just happened. And that's the unfortunate thing. This patient happened to be on Coumadin, which thins the blood. And when the blood is thin, instead of having a little bit of a bleed, he had unfortunately a very large one. But still, Coumadin is very important for people that need it because it keeps people alive. So there's always this balance that we're trying to do working with your medical doctors in order to try to keep you seeing the best possible, but of course having the best quality of life too. Here's another picture of a patient's right eye, and you can see where the bleeding is right in the middle here, and that's where the wet type is, right in the center. Here's pictures of the angiogram, and as that dye goes through the veins, you can see how it gets brighter and brighter until in the lower right-hand picture, that's at the end of the pictures, it's bright white, all that leaking. That's when we talk about leaking, that is exactly what we're talking about. This right here in that lower right-hand picture, that's that dye leaking out of the leaky blood vessel. That is the wet macular degeneration right there. Here's a picture of one of the other machines we have in the office called the OCT. This is the retina we're looking at right here. And underneath the retina, there's this dark area. That's the swelling, and underneath that is the bleeding. 
This should be nice and flat. Unfortunately, it's not because there is a leaky blood vessel underneath the retina that's literally swelling the retina underneath. And that's all this, that's all the dark uh, area underneath the retina here. So what's the medical treatment we have right now? Vitamins and minerals, modifying the diet, exercise, protect yourself from sun, smoking is not good, and then good blood pressure and cholesterol. Well, let's talk about AREDs. AREDs, AREDs, AREDs. People have heard it a million times. When you go to the grocery store, you look at the vitamins, you see AREDs, A-R-E-D-S. Well, it stands for Age-Related Eye Disease Study. So we'll just call it AREDs. That's a lot easier, right? But uh, basically, the study, the first started in, on, on November 1992, and the last visit was 2001. So we've had this information for over 10 years now, you know, this, since the AREDs study, and that was the original one. Basically, there's people that they saw that had no macular degeneration at all. So they were category one. You can see this is the macula, the middle part of the vision that we're pointing at. And these are the arteries and veins in the retina. And they're no, or they're just a few small drusen, but nothing, nothing to really speak about, okay? Category two was early macular degeneration. So you can see right here in the middle, there are these couple little tiny yellow dots, maybe even hard to see up on the screen. The category two, again, very mild macular degeneration here. Once we get to the intermediate macular degeneration or the category three, you can really see these yellow dots. They're much larger. And these are the patients that we worry about you know, significantly. Advanced, they have bleeding. This is the wet type over here on this picture on the left. And then the right type is advanced dry. You can see it's right here. The color's different in the middle here of the macula. And that's really the thinning of the retina, the atrophy that we talk about. So what did they study? They studied antioxidants, vitamin C, E, beta carotene. They uh, studied zinc. Then they studied people with antioxidants and zinc. And then, of course, the placebo, meaning those patients didn't get any of these antioxidants. And what did they find? Well, you know, they gave them the doses that are listed on the screen. And I don't expect anyone to remember those numbers. There won't be a quiz after this, so you don't have to worry about that. And I don't have too many graphs or charts, but the ones I do have... We're going to translate, okay? I don't know about that. So basically, this graph shows the rate to people getting worst macular degeneration. And they're looking at all the groups here. And basically, with time, you can see the graph is going up higher and higher. So all that means is the longer you have macular degeneration for, the more chance you're having of it getting worse. And that makes sense. I think that's Pretty, that's pretty understandable to everyone. Longer you have it, more chance of it getting worse. Now, if you notice here on this graph, category three and four, those are the people that had either pretty moderate macular degeneration or very severe macular degeneration. Those are the people, and if you look at this yellow line, they were advancing at 28%, and the people that had the antioxidants and zinc, the blue line, they were less. They were 20%. So you saved 8% by taking that antioxidants and zinc. That's what this big research trial figured out. So basically, in summary, the way that they said, how do you reduce the risk if you have category 3 or 4? Well, if you take antioxidants, it reduces your risk by 17%. Zinc, 21%. But you take that antioxidants and zinc, and look, you're reduced by 25%. So that's much better, and that's why that AREDS formula has antioxidants and zinc. Now, if you have early macular degeneration, now this is important. If you have the early type, there was no benefit seen from these supplements, from the vitamins. So not every single person that has macular degeneration should really need to have these high-dose vitamins. Now, that might be news to a lot of people. And what I want to tell everyone is you can't believe everything you see on the Internet and you're reading the paper because there's a lot of garbage out there. There's a lot of garbage out there. But talk to your doctor about it because your doctor will be able to decipher that for you and be able to explain what's what. But remember, if you have the early AMD, you don't necessarily need the AREDS vitamins. I'm not saying don't take them. They're not going to hurt. But you, don't wanna be, you wanna be careful. You don't, you don't wanna be taking really high dose vitamins unless it's something that's proven to help you. A regular multivitamin might be enough. And again, important to talk to your doctor about that. For the intermediate or the advanced AMD, the antioxidants plus zinc or the zinc alone, they significantly reduce the risk of developing worse AMD. So how about people losing vision? 
Well, all this graph means is that the people in the blue had the antioxidants and zinc. The people in the yellow had just the placebo, the sugar pill. And you can see that the people that had just the placebo, 29% of them lost three or more lines of vision on that chart. So they were reading three lines worse in the chart. And then when you look at the people that had the vitamins, only 23% lost that. So people are still losing vision. These vitamins are not a cure, but they do help slow it down. And that's the important thing that I always tell all my patients. Unfortunately, we don't have a cure, but at least the vitamins can slow it down. So AREDS 2, okay, let's try to make it more confusing and have a second AREDS and have more pills on the shelf at the grocery store, right? That, that's exactly what it is. There's like 10 different brands out there. When I went to the grocery store the other day, I looked and my head started to spin. I mean, it's unbelievable. So let's talk about this. This study started in 2006. They finished enrolling patients in 2008, but they're watching them for five to six years. So 2008, five to six years, well, we're not going to have results till probably 2013. So anything that says AREDS2, they don't have the final information yet. So we're going to talk about what is in that AREDS2, but the truth is the only thing that's proven so far is the regular AREDS, the first AREDS. Now, I'm not saying AREDS2 is bad. It's probably going to be good, but I'm just telling you the final decision, the final data, all that research that was done, it hasn't been completed yet. So no one knows until the data is completely done. So what's that AREDS2 formula? Well, vitamin C, vitamin E, those are pretty familiar things. They're antioxidants. The zinc works as an antioxidant, and it works with the vitamin C and E. Omega-3 fatty acids. This is something new that they added to the AREDS2 that was not in the AREDS1. Well, everyone's heard of omega-3s. That, that, that's pretty common. It's in fish. Everyone talks about that. Well, that helps ret retinal function and macular health. And then lutein. Everybody's talking about lutein. Well, that helps form the macular pigment, and that helps filter the blue light, and it also functions as an antioxidant. There's another one here at the bottom that got cut off, but it's zeaxanthine, the one with the Z, as my patients like to say. Well, that zeaxanthine and the lutein, as well as the omega-3, those are the ones that were added for the AREDS2, and again, I believe they're helpful. There's proof that they're helpful, but all that big study from the AREDS2 is just not complete yet to give you the exact numbers. There was other studies that proved that vitamin C, E, and zinc reduce the risk of AMD. And it's important to know that it's not just studies in the United States. These are studies done all over the world. And that's basically all I mean by these slides here. But how do you get these things without taking vitamins? You know, you're not going to get the exact doses in the vitamins. But vitamin E, you get in whole grains, vegetable oil, eggs, nuts. Zinc, you get in meat, poultry, fish, whole grains, and dairy products beta carotene and carrots, kale, spinach. Vitamin C you get in citrus fruits and juices, green peppers, broccoli, and potatoes. So those are just little kind of handy things to know. So what should you do to prevent AMD or wet AMD? Well, here's the first one. Eat fish. I got some trout, salmon, and mackerel here. Everyone remembers the mackerel degeneration now, right? But, uh, you know, eat fish. That's a real easy thing to remember. So let's talk about why should you eat fish. Well, there's a 40% reduction of AMD if you eat fish one time a week, according to this study in 2006. And the people that had consumed fish three times a week really had reduced late macular degeneration. There was no association with this uh, if you added butter, margarine, or nuts, or anything like that. I mean, that was purely the fish that they looked at. And it's because of the omega-3s. I mean, that's going to be good for all comers, but the people they, yes, yes, exactly. So, I mean, people, anybody who's eating fish is going to have a less likelihood of macular degeneration than anybody else. I guess that is the best thing, way to put it. They study twins. You know, when you check one twin and the other twin and, you know, they have the same genes. They're identical twins. Well, if one smokes and the other doesn't smoke and all of a sudden you see that the smoker comes out with AMD sooner before the non-smoker, well, that makes sense. They're the ex almost the exact same genes for these two people, but one guy's smoking, the other guy isn't. And look who got AMD first. So remember, current smokers are two times risk of AMD. Past smokers are 1.7. So at least if you quit, you're reducing that chance. But if you increase your fish intake, especially greater than two servings or a week, all of a sudden, you're protecting yourself. If you are a smoker even, you're reducing your risk of AMD. So 
if you just can't quit, no matter what you do, smoking, at least be eating a lot of fish, right? I mean, seriously. So let's see here. Uh, results of other studies. They all pretty much say that the omega-3 associated with 38% reduction of risk of late AMD, twice weekly fish intake. Um, there's no perfect study that is studying the omega-3. You know, a prospective study, meaning they're enrolling patients and they're checking them before all this and after, except the AREDS-2 is studying that omega-3. So once we get that data, that's going to be a real important thing to talk about. But I bet they're going to prove in that AREDS-2 study that the omega-3s are good for you. I'm almost positive, but we don't have that yet. Now, again, the AREDS-2, that's all that slide says. The fish intake, a consumption of greater than one servings of fish per week compared with less than one per month, there was a difference of 42%. So that's a, that's a big difference. I mean, if I'm having greater than one serving per week and the guy next to me is only having one per month, I'm in much better shape, 42% lower risk. So I guess that's moral of the story is keep eating that fish. What else? Well, eat fruits and dark leafy green vegetables. Now those aren't the only dark leafy green vegetables out there. Those are just the ones that I've found to get a picture of here. So all the studies say fruit intake inversely associated with risk. What that basically means is that the more fruit and vegetables you have, especially the green leafy ones, the less likelihood of your AMD getting worse. Three or more servings per day of fruits decreased the risk by 36% compared with people that are eating less than one and a half servings per day. So three or more servings, I tell you what, well, not even talking about AMD, that's going to be good for you for a variety of reasons. Your whole body health head to toe. What else here? Consuming spinach or collard greens five or more times per week reduce the risk of AMD, the wet type, by 43%. The dark green and leafy vegetables are rich in lutein and zeaxanthin. So we're talking about that lutein and zeaxanthin again. They're talking about getting it in a vitamin, but that dark green leafy vegetable, that's rich in those two very two things, the lutein and zeaxanthin. So that's a natural way to get it too. So they did another study here. Women less than 75 year old with stable intake of lutein and zeaxanthin substantially lowered their rate of progressing to AMD. So there it is again. All these studies are kind of showing that lutein and zeaxanthin are good, but again, we're waiting for that AREDS2 data to come out. But it's protecting, especially these women less than 75 years old, according to that study. So let's just kind of look at the lutein and zeaxanthin content of all these different fruits and vegetables. Looks like kale's the big winner. Kale's right at the top of that list, and that is really the highest amount of the lutein zeaxanthin. At the bottom is that green pepper and corn, but they still have it. Nothing wrong with those two, right? But everything in the middle there, it's going to be good. Avoid dietary fat, especially baked goods and processed foods. Now, if anybody has a sweet tooth like I do, we all know that's easier said than done, but it's important. They talked about studies of people that had dietary fat intake and how that affected the AMD or the atrophy or the going from the dry to the wet. And it basically showed that the more saturated and polyunsaturated, all those fancy words, the more fat you take in, the higher your risk. But that's true of a lot of problems, problems with your heart too. But definitely that contributes to AMD as well. The processed baked goods increase the risk twofold, two times. Nuts once a week were associated with a reduced risk. So I think that's kind of nice to know, that nuts aren't bad for you. I mean, would you rather have a cookie or some nuts? I don't know. Everyone has their own personal preference. But at least we know the nuts, at least certain types of nuts, can be protective once a week. Eat less red meat. Now, I like a cheeseburger just as much as the guy next to me. But when I saw that, I said, oh, you know what? There may be something to this here. When they talk about meat, they're talking about all kinds of red meat. Veal, roast beef, you know, meatloaf. I don't know how many people are eating rabbit, but lamb chops, you know, even pork chops they put in there and mixed dishes of the above. Now the consumption of red meat and chicken, red meat consumption far exceeded chicken and fish intake according to the survey that was done. And 25% of the population consumed red meat at least 10 times per week. I thought that was kind of high, but that's what the study said in 2009. Red meat, they said there's higher red meat associated with early AMD, that's that type one and two. Remember the people that didn't benefit from the vitamins. And then the consumption of red meat, if you had it greater than 10 times a week, it was much more risky than if you had it less than five times per week. So I'm not telling everyone to cut it out completely. I mean, that might be difficult, 
but at least reduce if you can. Associations were weaker for processed meat than for fresh red meat, and basically what that was showing us was that people that had a lot of salami or sausages greater than one time a month versus people that had it less than one time a month, they were strongly uh, associated with the early AMD types and the late AMD. Total chicken intake was not associated with early AMD, but uh, it was actually inversely associated with late AMD. What that basically means is that the total chicken amount that people have, it didn't really show that it was doing any damage. If anything, it might have actually been helping some people. Fish consumption was not associated with AMD in this particular study. So you're getting a lot of different mixed things, but that's why we're waiting for that AREDS2 data. The high intake of red meat, well, what's the problem with it? There, so there's more of this, uh, what we call heme iron. There's higher levels of nitrosamines. All this stuff basically means is it creates chemicals and problems in the body that can cause damage, including damage to the, AMD, uh, to the macula and AMD. Another thing to do is increase the intake of vitamin D from foods and supplements. Well, the dietary, you know, they question people, how much milk, fish, margarine, cereal, how, how much are you taking? Well, those are all sources of vitamin D. So, I mean, milk and fish, I think, are pretty easy for people to have vitamin D that way. Supplements, people take vitamin D pills, you know, vitamins and whatnot. But sunlight, no one talks about sunlight. Everyone talks about protecting your eyes with the sunglasses, but actually the sunlight hitting your skin is what really helps your body make the vitamin D and use it. And I don't think people talk about that, but it's important. Now, going to a tanning bed or going outside and getting sunburned, that's not good for skin cancer and all those things, but getting a little bit of sunlight is not a bad thing, okay, as long as you're wearing your sunglasses. Now, why vitamin D? It's anti-inflammatory. We worry about this inflammation. And it also helps modulate the immune system, and it can suppress things that lead to AMD. It also is shown to inhibit the growing of those bad blood vessels, like the ones in wet macular degeneration that cause all the trouble. So what else? Well, exercise. And if you're overweight, reduce your weight. Now, I don't think I'm reinventing the wheel here. I think everyone kind of knows that that's what we're supposed to be, all be doing, right? But let's talk about exactly how much and, and, and what's going to help. So basically, the research, research has shown that people who did exercise, even if they had meat or whatnot, it did protect them against AMD. When it came to running, they said it, the risk of AMD decreased by 10% per kilometer per day with the running distance. Now, I don't think everyone here is going to be going out and running a marathon tomorrow, but even walking is good. And that's the thing. It's just going for a walk. It doesn't have to be a walk for 10 miles, but going for a walk around the block, going to walk even around the house. Whatever you can do, any little bit you can do, movement, exercise, physical activity is going to be good for you for multiple reasons. This one said that there was a reduced risk of wet AMD by 30% when walking city blocks. Well, that walking city blocks doesn't sound too bad. I mean, I think that's doable. How about this one said uh, reduced risk of developing wet AMD by 70% if you had greater than three sessions or three sessions per week of sweat-inducing exercise. So that's the thing is you got to be working enough to make at least a little bit of a sweat and you're reducing your risk by 70%. If you just do that three times a week per, at least, that, I think that's doable. I think that's something that we can do. How about this? Higher BMI, increased risk of progression. Well, the BMI is basically, a, that's a measure of your body weight and your height. It's a calculation that your doctor, primary care usually does. The higher that is, again, the higher the risk. There's a two fold increased risk of getting worse AMD if you had a higher waist circumference to waist and hip ratio. So basically all of us can know that the bigger this is right here, the higher the risk of a lot of things. But AMD is part of that group. Again, three times per week, vigorous physical activity associated with reduced progression of 25%. So all these different studies are saying the same thing. Exercise, diet, vitamins. Now this one, avoid sunlight exposure or protect from sunlight. Now, you want to get a little sun, like I said, to get that vitamin D, just a little bit here and there, at least. You want to be inside all the time. No one does. But when you're outside, protect the eyes with sunglasses. Exposure to summer sun greater than five hours a day during people's teens and 30s and a baseline exam increase the risk of developing increased retinal pigment and AMD by two times. Now, unless there's a lot of people that are teenagers here or in their 30s, which I'm looking around, I'm not seeing too many teenagers, maybe a couple, there's one back there, yeah. But, uh, you know, back then, over five hours a day, that 
that put us at risk later, and, and we didn't really know that that too much. It's not bad to be outside, but if you're going to be out there for more than five hours, I'm hoping you're wearing sunglasses, especially the kids. And all of us might have grandkids, nephews, nieces. Not a bad idea to get them protecting their eyes young. Another thing that was interesting to me was more than 10 severe sunburns during your youth made you more likely than those who had one or no sunburns to develop large drusen by 10 years. Oh gosh, I, I was surprised to hear that. The use of hats and sunglasses at least half the time in those reporting highest sun exposure in teens and 30s was associated with a decreased risk of developing drusen. So basically, the kids that were wearing the hats and sunglasses at least half the time, not even all the time, but at least half the time, that was a decreased risk of developing AMD later. So that's, again, everyone has family that's maybe younger in their teens and 30s, and let's get them going on the, protecting themselves. Avoid smoking and secondhand smoke. Now, that second part, the secondhand smoke, is really important. I know patients that they come in, they say, Doc, I don't smoke. I haven't smoked a day in my life. And then their husband or wife's in the corner there, and they just smell like an ashtray. And I look in their eyes, and I say, my gosh, their macular degeneration is so bad. I said, well, does he or she, does, do, do they smoke in the house? With, oh, yeah, they smoke in the house. They've probably been smoking in the house with you for the last 30, 40 years, and it's affecting the eyes. It's affecting the eyes, so we've got to watch out for that. Secondhand smoke, too. So they compared smokers, current and former smokers, with non-smokers, and they looked at it as being a risk for AMD. And of course, they found a strong association between AMD and the number of pack years of smoking. So that's the number of years you smoked and how many packs you smoke a day. They take that number of packs, they take the number of years, and they calculate it together, and they call it pack years. And there's a strong correlation between the two. So increased amount of smoking, increased risk of AMD. Greater than 40 years of smoking, there was a 2.75% odds ratio compared with non-smokers. So 40 pack years, if you smoke a pack a day for 40 years, that's 40 pack years right there. So greater than 40 pack years of cigarettes was associated with odds ratio, not only for the dry type, but the wet type. So it's both types that affects. And if you stop smoking, it was associated with reducing the risk of AMD. It's never too late to stop. The risk in those who had not smoked for over 20 years was comparable to non-smokers. So that's one thing. If someone says, well, Doc, you know, I did smoke, but I quit 20 years ago. Well, good. Now your risk is the same as someone who didn't smoke. So that's, I think that's good to know. You know, people tw 20 years out, that's, and there's plenty of people out there that smoked 20 years ago and stopped. Well, now their risk is the same as non-smokers. And this was the same for men and women. That passive smoking, the secondhand smoking, that increased the risk by 1.87 for the, the odds ratio there. So cardiovascular disease and hypertension, people say, does my blood pressure, does my heart, does that affect me for AMD? And there is a strong association with people that have heart disease and wet, and wet macular degeneration. So there's an association between the two. And that could be because a lot of people that have heart disease also smoke. They might also be overweight a bit, have a higher body mass. They might also have high blood pressure and high cholesterol. Well, those things, like we talked about, they make the heart have trouble, well, they make the eyes have trouble too with macular degeneration. So conclusions there regarding that, well, we talked about it. Cardiovascular disease is associated with development of wet AMD. So control that blood pressure and cholesterol, avoid smoking, and maintain a normal body weight. Oh, that sounds easy enough. Not really. We all know that's a lot of work, but it's important. So why is the incidence, the prevalence of AMD, it's going down a little bit. So for the first time in, that we know, less people are getting it now. There's still tons of people getting it, but a little bit less than it was just a couple years ago. And it's because people are smoking less. People have been changing their diets. Everyone out there has been working on this. People are exercising and doing more physical activity, and they're getting their high blood pressure treated well by their doctor. So that was really good news. At least it's a little bit of good news. You know, everyone's hearing all this stuff going on. Little good news that as a public, the United States of America, we're doing a better job of these things. We can always work harder, but at least we're doing better. And the prevalence of AMD is going down just a bit now. We can hopefully keep, make it go, keep making it go down if we keep working on these things. So my recommendations. All that stuff before, that was just the appetizer. Now here, here's the main course. So let's just get to the point here, right? So my recommendations for family members of patients with AMD, everything we've been talking about, do not smoke, avoid secondhand smoke, 
abstain from heavy alcohol consumption. Now, alcohol consumption is not the big culprit, it's the moderation. We don't want heavy alcohol consumption. Now, people might ask, well, what's heavy? Well, I think we all know what heavy is. All right. Avoid exposure to sun and sunburns. Okay, again, sunglasses are very important, but if you're getting sunburnt, you're probably out in the sun for too long. Wear blue blocking sunglasses and hats. Again, very important, never too late to start that. Control your blood pressure and cholesterol. Work with your primary care doctor on those things. Dark leafy green vegetables, especially the spinach, and of course the kale. Kale is that number one guy. Half cup, four to five times a week. Now, my wife started making some kale, and I tell you what, it wasn't bad. I didn't, I didn't have it too much before. It wasn't bad. So uh, worth a try. Give it a go and see what you think. Avoid red meat. You can reduce it a little bit. If, if you don't want to eliminate it completely, at least reduce it. Anything you'd reduce is going to be helpful. Multivitamins. We're going to talk about that in a bit, a little more. Fruits three times a day, vegetables and nuts. Avoid processed foods, especially those baked goods. A lot of that processed foods, not good for us. has a lot of the unsaturated, saturated fats. Exer exercise to induce sweating three times a week. I'm not telling people to run five miles a day, but I think if you can at least sweat three times a week, you're doing yourself a favor. If you're overweight, try to reduce weight. And if you're exercising and you're watching your foods, you're probably going to reduce weight as a result of those things anyway. Fish high in omega-3 fatty acids three times a week or a fish oil supplement. Now, some people just don't like fish, and that's okay. You don't have to like it. If you don't like it, there are fish oil supplements out there. I don't even think they taste like fish, so that's good if you don't like fish. If you like fish, great. More power to you. I like it. Increase intake of vitamin D from supplements and or foods. Again, milk, fish, margarine, and cereal have that vitamin D. So let's talk about the fish. We're talking all this fish. Well, what, what fish are you supposed to eat? Well, it talks about the grams per three ounce portion of omega-3 here. And you can see salmon's pretty high up there. Anchovies, uh, the mackerel, of course. But there's a lot, I mean, sardines, herring, trout, bass, tuna, perch, snapper, all of these fish, I mean, almost every fish out there is going to have omega-3. So it, you're not really going to be able to go wrong with anything that's readily available. Tuna, of course, is probably the easiest one to see. A tuna salad, you know, any of that stuff's easy to get to. So category one and two. Remember, those category one and two were the people that had very few drusen or very small drusen small to moderate. These are the mild macular degeneration folks. We got to figure out what risk are you? Are you the mild category one and two or are you the moderate to severe three or four? Well, who's going to figure that out for you? Now, your retina specialist is going to figure that out. And once we figure that out, we can tell you, hey, the AREDS vitamins were proven to slow this down if you are category three or four. Category one or two, they weren't proven to slow it down but I tell people, if you want to take it, I'm not going to stop you because I still think it's good for you. But you can probably just take a regular multivitamin, a complete vitamin, and that's still going to help you as well. You know, the diet, the exercise, all that's going to be just as important in that multivitamin. But you don't need to take the AREDS vitamins unless you fit these categories. The other thing that's important to note is if you have that category 3 or 4 in one eye, but the other eye is mild, so you have one that's worse than the other, it's still important to take the vitamins because you want to slow down the one that's mild from getting worse. And if you have one eye that's worse, the other eye might be around the corner from getting worse. So we've got to worry about that. Now, for uh, family members and patients with AMD, for Category 1 and 2, if you are someone that's Category 1 or 2, I want you to follow all those recommendations we just talked about. And then you can take a multivitamin. Whether you want to take one with lutein or without, that's fine. But you don't need to take the AREDS. And if you don't know what category you are, you need to ask your doctor the next time they take a look at your eyes or ask them about the vitamins. But if you ask them the category and they don't know, then it might be time to you know, ask them, well, I heard that the category 1 and 2 for macular degeneration, they don't need the AREDS vitamins. A multivitamin is good enough. And category 3 and 4 need it. And then they'll understand where you're coming from on that. For category 3 and 4, that's the people that are more at risk, all the same recommendations we talked about, diet, exercise, smoking, sun, all that stuff, but we do recommend the AREDS vitamins because it is shown to slow it down. Now, when it comes to AREDS versus AREDS 2, I bet once that AREDS 2 data comes out, if it's proven to be good, then everyone's going to say AREDS works and AREDS 2 works maybe the same, maybe better, or maybe less. We won't know until that data comes out. 
So lutein and zeaxanthin and the omega-3s, that's all being studied in AREDS too. And the moment we have that information, we'll be able to give all the patients a good answer of what's better, the one with lutein or the one without. Because that's the big question everyone wants to know because everything's sitting on the shelf right now at Walgreens, CVS, you know, Giant Eagle. So before starting your AREDS vitamins, get your approval from your medical doctor. You might be taking other medicines that might not agree with these vitamins. Or it might be toxic. If you're already taking vitamin C or already taking vitamin E, you might want to stop those before you start taking the AREDS vitamins because you might get too much of a dose. Now, you know, they say there's no such thing as too much of a good thing. Well, well actually, there is. You can overdose on these vitamins. So you've got to be careful. And whenever people say, well, how many pills am I supposed to take? Well, that problem is there's so many brands out there, that question has a different answer for every brand. So you've got to read the pill bottle. It tells you how many pills to take and how many a day for that particular brand. And if you follow those instructions, it's going to give you the recommended dose for that brand. But provided you're not taking all these extra vitamins or extra other pills, because then that could interact. And that's why I want you to talk to your doctor about that. Now, the smoking, th this, comes into, this comes into play here because there is a smoker's formula of these AREDS vitamins. And that's important. If you smoked or you smoked even in the past, some people say seven years, some people say 10 or 20 years. But if you smoked or smoked in the past, you really don't want to take that regular AREDS formula. And that's because that beta carotene in there, there's a higher risk of lung cancer in smokers. So you don't want beta carotene if you're a smoker or a past smoker. You want to take that smoker's formula, which is basically the AREDS formula minus the beta carotene. Now, it might have lutein in it, and that's fine. That AREDS 2 formula, the new one that they're researching, that one took out the beta carotene and it put in the lutein and zeaxanthin in there. So we'll see. If that proves to be good, maybe everyone will switch to the one with lutein. But for right now, definitely the smokers should not be taking the beta carotene. And for non-smokers, the AREDS is the proven one. The AREDS 2, everyone feels is going to be good. And it's, a lot of people recommend it. I recommend it too. But it's not fully proven yet. Okay, we talked about a lot. We do have a lot of information in the back there. I just put the brochure up there. Focus Macula Pro and Focus Macula Pro with lutein, those are two kinds of vitamins that we sell at our offices. And the only reason we do that is because if we're checking you anyway and it saves you a trip to the store, it cuts out a middleman and we can actually offer them less for less than almost all the stores out there. So I figure save people money, save them convenience, at least they know what they're taking and we can tell them right there. But I truthfully, I don't care what brand people take. It doesn't matter. As long as it has what you need in there, and if it's a reasonable cost, I think that's even better. But the main thing is to protect ourselves.